Chapter 17. One word of explanation. In the late 18th century and in the 19th century, even more so, when a family member died or someone with whom you were connected, it was the custom for everyone to wear black for a prolonged period of time, months, certainly. And this was referred to as being in mourning. If your clothes were black clothes, as black as possible, every item of clothing, that was mourning, being in mourning. And of course, Kate had just lost her father. So she was dressed all in black. Chapter 17. It was with a heavy heart and many sad forebodings which no effect could banish, that Kate Nickleby, on the morning appointed for the commencement of her engagement with Madame Mantolini, left the city when its clocks yet wanted a quarter of an hour to eight, and threaded her way alone amid the noise and bustle of the streets towards the west end of London. At this early hour, many sickly girls, whose business, like that of the poor worm, is to produce with patient toil the finery that bedecks the thoughtless and luxurious traverse our streets, making towards the scene of their daily labour and catching as if by stealth in their hurried walk the only gap of wholesome air and glimpse of sunlight which cheers their monotonous existence during the long train of hours that make a working day. She arrived at Madame Mantellini's some minutes before the appointed hour, and after walking a few times up and down in the hope that some other female might arrive and spare her the embarrassment of stating her business to the servant, she knocked timidly at the door, which after some delay was opened by the footman, who had been putting on his striped jacket as he came upstairs and was now intent on fastening his apron. Is Madame Mantellini in? faltered Kate. Oh, not often out, but this time, miss, replied the man, in a tone which rendered miss something more offensive than my dear. Can I see her? asked Kate. Aye, replied the man, holding the door in his hand and honouring the, honouring the inquirer with a stare and a broad grin. Lord, no! I came by her own appointment, said Kate. I am, I, I, I am to be employed here. Oh, you should have rung the worker's bell, said the footman, touching the handle of one on the doorpost. Let me see, uh, I forgot, uh, Miss Nickleby, isn't it? Yes, replied Kate. You're to walk upstairs then, please said the man. Madame Mantellini wants to see you. This way, take care of those things on the floor. The man led the way to the second story and ushered Kate into a back room communicated by folding doors with the apartment in which she had first seen the mistress of the establishment. If you'll wait here a moment, said the man, I'll tell her presently. Having made this promise with much affability he retired and left Kate alone. There was not much to amuse in the room of which the most attractive feature was a half-length portrait in oil of Mr Mantellini whom the artist had depicted scratching his head in an easy manner and thus displaying to advantage a diamond ring, the gift of Madame Mantellini before her marriage. There was, however, the sound of voices in conversation in the next room and as the conversation was loud and the partition thin, Kate could not help discovering that they belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Mantellini. If you will be odiously, damnably, outrageously jealous, my soul, 
said Mr. Mantellini. You will be very miserable, horrid miserable, damnation miserable. And then there was the sound as though Mr. Mantellini was sipping his coffee. I am miserable, returned Ms. Madame Mantellini, evidently pouting. Then you are an ungrateful, unworthy, damned, unthankful little fairy, said Mr. Mantellini. I am not, returned Madame with a sob. Oh, don't put its, itself out of humour, said Mr. Mantellini, breaking an egg. It is a pretty, bewitching little damned countenance, and it should not be put out of humour, for it spoils its loveliness and makes it cross and gloomy, like a frightful, naughty, damned hobgoblin. I am not to be brought round in that way always, rejoined Madame Mantellini. It shall be brought round in any way it likes, and not brought round at all if it likes that better, retorted Mr. Mantellini with his egg spoon in his mouth. It's very easy to talk, said Mrs. Mantellini. Well, it's not, not so easy when one is eating a damnation egg, replied Mr. Mantellini, for the, for the yolk runs down one's waistcoat and the yolk of an egg doesn't match any waistcoat but a yellow waistcoat, damn it. You were flirting with her during the whole night, said Madame Mantellini, apparently desirous to lead the conversation back to the point from which it had strayed. No, no, my life. You were said madame i had my eye upon you all the time oh bless the little winkling tinkling eye was it on me all the time cried mantellini in a sort of daisy lazy rapture oh damn it and i say once more resumed madame that you ought not to waltz with anybody but your own wife and I will not bear it, Mantellini, if I take poison first. She will not take poison and have horrid pains, will she? Said Mantellini, who by this time had moved his chair and was taken and had taken his position nearer to his wife. She will not take poison because... She has a damned fine husband who might have married two countesses and a dowager. Two countesses, interposed Madame. You told me it was one before. Oh, oh no, two, cried Mantellini. Two damned fine women, real countesses and splendid fortunes, damn it. So why didn't you? asked Madame playfully. Why didn't I? replied her husband. Had I not seen at a morning concert the damnedest little fascinator in all the world? And with that little fascinator is my wife. May not all the countesses and dowagers in England be... Mr. Mandolini did not finish the sentence, but he gave Madame Mandolini a very loud, and prolonged kiss, which Madame Mantellini returned, after which there seemed to be some more kissing mixed up with the progress of the breakfast. And what about the cash, my existence, Jewel? said Mantellini, when these endearments had ceased. How much have we in hand? Very little indeed, replied Madame. Oh, well, then we must get some more, said Mantellini. We must uh, have some discount out of old Nickleby to carry the war on with, damn it. You can't want any more just now, said Madame coaxingly. My life's soul, returned her husband. There is, there is a horse for sale at Scrubs which it would be a sin and a crime to lose. And it's going, my senses joy, 
it's going for nothing. For nothing, cried Madame. I'm glad of that. For actually nothing, replied Manta Lady. A hundred guineas down will buy him, mane and crest and legs and tail, all of the damnedest beauty. I will ride him in the park before the very chariots of the rejected countesses. The damned old dodger will faint with grief and rage. The other two will say, oh, he is married. He has made away with himself. It is a damn thing. It is all up. They will hate each other damnably and wish you dead and buried. Ha, 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 damn it. Madame Mantellini's prudence, if she had any, was not proof against these triumphal pictures. After a little jingling of keys, she observed that she would see what was in her desk, and rising for that purpose, opened the folding door and walked into the room where Kate was seated. Dear me, child, exclaimed Madame Mantellini, recoiling in surprise, how came you here? Child? cried Mantellini, hurrying in. How came... Oh, damn it. How do you do? I have been waiting here some time, ma'am, said Kate, addressing Madame Mantellini. The servant must have forgotten to let you know I was here, I think. You really must see to that man, said Madame, turning to her husband. He forgets everything. I will twist his damned nose off his countenance for leaving such a very pretty creature all alone by herself, <laughs> said her husband. Mantellini, cried Madame, you forget yourself. I don't forget you, my soul, and never shall, and never can said Mantellini, kissing his wife's hand and grimacing aside to Miss Nickleby, who turned away. Appeased by this compliment, the lady of the business took some papers from her desk, which she handed to Mr. Mantellini, who received them with great delight. She then requested Kate to follow her, and after several feints on the path past of Mr. Mantellini to attract the young lady's attention, they went away leaving that gentleman extended as to at full length on a sofa with his heels in the air and a newspaper in his hand. Madame Mantellini led the way down a flight of stairs and through a passage to a large room at the back of the premises where there were a, a number of young women employed in sewing, cutting out, making up, altering and various other processes known only to those who are cunning in the arts of millinery and dressmaking. It was a, a close room with a skylight and as dull and quiet as a room could be. On Madame Mantellini calling aloud for Miss Nag, a short bustling overdressed female full of importance presented herself and all the young ladies suspended their operations for a moment and whispered to each other sundry criticisms upon the make and texture of Miss Nickleby's dress, her complexion, cast of features and personal appearance, with as much good breeding as one could expect displayed by a very best society in a crowded ballroom. Ah, Miss Nag, said Madame Mantellini, this is the young person of whom I spoke. Miss Nag bestowed a reverential smile upon Madame Mantellini, which she dexterously transformed into a gracious one for Kate, and said that certainly, although it was a great deal of trouble to have young people who are wholly unused to the business, still she was sure the young person would try to do her best. Impressed with this conviction, she, that is Miss Nag, felt an honest interest in her already. I think that for the present, at all events, it will be better for Miss Nickleby to come into the showroom with you and try things on for people, said Madame Mantellini. She will not be able for the present to make 
to be of much use in any other way, and her appearance will... Will suit me very well, Madame Mantolini, interrupted, interrupted Miss Nag. So it will, and to be sure, I might have known that you would not be long in finding that out, for you have so much taste in all these matters that really, as I often say to the young ladies, I don't know how, when, or where you could possibly have acquired all you know. <laughs> Miss Nickleby, and I are quite a pair, Madam Mantolini. Oh, I am, only I am a little darker than Miss Nickleby, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think my foot is uh, a little smaller. Miss Nickleby, I am sure you will not be offended by my saying that. Uh, really, one, uh, one consideration is that our family always, always have been celebrated for our small feet. Ever since, <laughs> ever since our family had any feet at all, and in, indeed, I think I, I, I had a, once an uncle, Madame Mantellini, who lived in Cheltenham, and he had the most excellent business as a tobacconist. <laughs> when only he had very small feet, such small feet that they were no bigger than those that are usually joined to the end of wooden legs. With the most symmetrical feet, Madame Mantellini, that you could ever imagine. Here, Miss Nag paused to take breath. And while she pauses, it may be observed, not that she was marvellously loquacious and marvellously deferential to Madame Mantellini, since these folks require no comment whatsoever, but that every now and again she was accustomed in the torrent of her discourse to produce a loud, shrill, clear <laughs> the import and meaning of which was variously interpreted by her acquaintances, holding that Miss Snag dealt in exaggeration and in introduced the monosyllable when any fresh invention was in course of coinage in her brain. Others thought that when she wanted a word, she threw it in to gain time, and others that she might produce one of these outbursts to prevent anybody else from striking into the conversation. It may be further remarked that Miss Nag still aimed at youth, although she had shot beyond it years ago, and that she was weak and vain, and one of those people who are best described by the axiom that you may not trust them as far as you can see them, and certainly no further. You'll take care that Miss Nickleby understands her hours and so forth, said Madame Mantellini. So I'll leave her with you. You'll not forget my directions, Miss Nag? Miss Nag, of course, replied that to forget anything Madame Mantellini had directed was a moral impossibility. And that lady, disposing a general good morning amongst her assistants, sailed away. Charming creature, isn't she, Miss Nickleby? said Miss Nag, rubbing her hands together. I have seen very little of her, said Kate. I, I hardly know yet. And have you seen Mr. Mantellini? inquired Miss Nag. Yes. I have seen him twice. Isn't he a charming creature? Indeed, he doesn't strike me as being so, as being so by any means, replied Kate. No, my dear, no, cried Miss, Sna Miss Nag, elevating her hands. Why, goodness gracious mercy, where is your taste? Such a fine, tall, full-whiskered, dashing, gentlemanly man, with such teeth and hair and... <laughs> well, well, you do astonish me. I dare say I am very foolish, replied Kate, laying aside her bonnet. But as my opinion is of very little importance to him or anyone else, I do not regret having formed it and shall be slow to change it, I think. He's a very fine man, don't you think so? asked one of the young ladies. Indeed, he may be, for anything I could say to the contrary, replied Kate. 
And he drives very beautiful horses, doesn't he? Inquired another. I, I, I dare say he may, but I, 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 I never saw him, answered Miss Kate. Never saw them? Interposed Miss Nag. Oh, well, there it is at once, you know. How can you possibly pronounce an opinion upon a gentleman? I wonder if you don't see him as he turns out altogether. There was so much of the world, even of the little world of the country girl, in this idea of the old milliner, that Kate, who was anxious for every reason to change the subject, made no further remark and left Miss Nag in possession of the field. After a short distance, during which most of the young people made a closer inspection of Kate's appearance and compared notes respecting it, one of them offered to help her off with her shawl. And the offer being accepted, inquired whether she didn't find black very uncomfortable to wear. I do indeed, replied Kate with a bitter sigh. So dusty and hot observed the same speaker, adjusting her dress for her. Kate might have said that mourning is sometimes the coldest wear which mortals can assume, that it not only chills the breast of those it clothes, but extends its influence to summer friends, freezing up their sources of goodwill and kindness and withering all the buds of promise they so once so liberally put forth leaving nothing but bare and rotten hearts ex exposed. There are few who have lost a friend or relative constituting life in, in life their so sole dependence, who have not keenly felt this chilling influence of their sable garb, in other words, of their black mourning clothes. She had felt it acutely and feeling it at the moment, could not restrain her quiet tears. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry to have wounded you by my thoughtless speech, said her companion. I, 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 I didn't think of it. Are you in mourning for some near relative? For my father, answered Kate. For what relation, Miss Simmons? asked Miss Nag in an old audible voice. Her father, replied the other softly. Oh, her father, eh? said Miss Nag, without the slightest depression of her voice. Ah, a long, a, a long illness, Miss Simmons? Was it a long illness? Hush, replied the girl. I don't know. Our misfortune was very sudden, said Kate, turning away. Or I might purpose at a time like this enable myself to support it better. There had existed not a little desire in the room according to in its invariable custom when any new young person came in. But although it might have been very naturally increased by her appearance and emotion, the knowledge that it pained Kate in appearance and emotion was sufficient to repress even this curiosity. And Miss Nag, finding it hopeless to attempt extracting any further particulars, just then reluctantly commanded silence and bade the work begin again. In silence then the tasks were plied until half past one when a bag containing a, 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 a baked leg of mutton with potatoes appeared and was served in the kitchen. The meal over and the young ladies having enjoyed the additional relaxation of washing their hands, the work began again and was again performed in silence until the noise of carriages rattling through the streets and of loud double knocks at doors gave token of the day's work that, it, uh, that, that there, there were fortunate members of society in the, in the room above, and the proceedings were about to begin. One of these double knocks at Madame Mantellini's door announced 
the coming of some great lady, or rather some rich lady, for there is occasionally a distinction between riches and greatness, who had come with her, with her daughter, to approve of some court dresses, which had been a long time preparing, and upon which Kate was deputed to wait, accompanied by Miss Nag, and officered, of course, by Madame Mantellini. Kate's part in the pageant was humble enough, her duties being limited to holding articles of costume until Miss Nag, Ma Miss Nag was ready to try them on, and now and then tying a string or fastening a hook and eye. She might not unreasonably have supposed herself beneath the reach of any arrogance or bad humour, but it happened that the lady and her daughter were both out of temper that day, and the poor girl came in for her share of their revilings. She was awkward, her hands were cold, she was dirty, coarse, she could do nothing right. They wondered how Madame Mantellini could have such people about her, and they requested that, might, that they might see another young woman the next time they came in, and so forth. So common an assurance, an occurrence, would be hardly deserving of mention, but for its effect. Kate shed many bitter tears when these people were gone, and felt for the first time humbled by her occupation. She had, it is true, quailed at the prospect of drudgery and hard service, but she had felt no degradation in working for her bread until she found herself exposed, exposed to insolence and pride. Philosophy would have taught her that the degradation was on the side of those who had sunk so low as to display such passions habitually and without cause. But she was much too young for such consolation, and her honest feelings were hurt. May not the complaint that common people are above their station often take its rise in the fact of the uncommon people being below theirs. In such scenes of occupations, the time wore on until nine o'clock, nine o'clock, when Kate joined the dispirited with the occurrences of the day and hastened from the confinement of the workroom to join her mother at the street corner and walk home all the more sadly from having to disguise her real feelings and feign to participate in all the sanguine visions of her mother. Bless my soul, Kate, said Mrs Nickleby. I've been thinking all day what a delightful thing it would be for Madame Mantellini to take you into partnership. Such a likely thing too, you know. Why, poor dear papa's cousin, sister-in-law, Mr. Brown Dock, had, uh, was taken to partnership by a lady who, who kept a school at Hammersmith. He made his fortune in no time at all. I forget, by the by, whether uh, that was the same man who got a, a £10,000 prize in the lottery, but I think he was. Indeed, oh, I come to think of it, I'm sure he was. Mantellini and Nickleby, how well it would sound. And if dear Nicholas has any good fortune, we might have D Dr. Nickleby, the headmaster of Westminster School, living in the same street. Dear Nicholas, cried Kate, taking from her reticule her brother's letter from Dutheboy's Hall, in all our misfortunes, how happy it makes me, Mamma, to hear that he is doing well, and to find him writing in such good spirits. It consoles me for all we may undergo to think that he is comfortable and happy. Poor Kate. She little thought how weak her consolation was. And how soon she would be undeceived. <laughs>